Greetings, I'm Dr. Doug Campbell. About 13,000 years ago, human beings started to grow their own food, rather than living off of what they could hunt or forage in the wild. We still don't know exactly how or why this happened, since this development occurred before the advent of writing, but we do know that it changed human life forever. But did this agricultural revolution change human existence for the better? Or was the invention of agriculture just BS? The invention of agriculture is sometimes called the Neolithic Revolution because it happened in the tail end of the Stone Age. Now, when we say agriculture, what we are talking about is the domestication, first of all, of a variety of plant materials, mostly focusing on cereal grains, so like wheat, rice, barley, that sort of thing. Associated with this is also the domestication of certain species of animals, so cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, all that stuff that combine that all together, we refer to this as agriculture. It seems that the domestication of plants and animals occurred for the first time around 11,000 BC in the Fertile Crescent, the ancient Middle East. This is undoubtedly the most important thing that has ever happened in the history of the human race full stop. Nothing else has been of more consequence than this. It had broad reaching impacts on everything. Before we go into the consequences, it is worth dealing with at least briefly the question of why did the invention of agriculture happen where it happened? That is to say, in the ancient Middle East, the cradle of what we will call Western civilization, because now, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, in what we might term the golden age of racist thought, one common way of explaining this was, well, why did the advent of agriculture happen in the cradle of Western civilization first before it happened anywhere else? Well, because that's where the white people live, right? And we all know that surely white people are much cleverer than, you know, other racial categories living elsewhere in the world. You know, they're smarter, they're stronger, they're more industrious. So obviously, these are the guys who came up with agriculture first on planet Earth. This is what we might term the white supremacist version of history. And hopefully that's, that's a kind of thesis that makes everybody a little bit uncomfortable, at least. If it doesn't make you personally uncomfortable, you might be a racist. But there are fortunately other ways of explaining this. Um, various scholars, particularly Jared Diamond, have pointed out that it just so happens that the ancient Fertile Crescent is not only the place where the people with the paler skin tones happened to live, but there were also a greater variety of indigenous cereal crops and domesticable animals to work with. And it was only to be expected that agriculture would originate in the place where there is the most stuff to make use of if you're going to be doing agriculture. Places like the Indus River Valley in India or uh, along the various river systems in China, in East Asia, that also have a great variety of crops and animals that are capable of being domesticated. Um, agriculture originated there pretty quickly after the Fertile Crescent. Uh, and the places that have the least native plants and animals that are capable of being raised by human beings, so we're talking about um, you know, the Americas, for example, or the continent of Australia, those places lagged significantly behind. Not because the people living there were somehow less clever or less worthwhile than Western white people, but they just environmentally had far less to work with. We don't know exactly why this happened anywhere, but it seems like this environmental thesis for the origins of agriculture has a bit more going for it than the white supremacist version. That to the side, let's talk a little bit about why this was so important. First of all, let's deal with some of the net positives. 
One of the things that is closely associated with the practice of agriculture is something that scholars call sedentism. That is, human beings living in fixed settlements. Scholars used to think that agriculture preceded sedentism. Now there is substantial evidence that in a lot of places it may have been the other way around. That human beings in environments where there's a lot of naturally occurring food sources, so seashores or marshlands, where you don't have to move around a lot, but there's still a lot that you can just harvest or forage naturally, um, that living in fixed settlements may have preceded agriculture and facilitated the development of agriculture. Regardless though, agriculture and fixed settlements always go hand in hand. It is certainly also true that per hour of labor, uh, an agriculturalist is capable of producing more calories than a hunter forager. So that means that agriculture is a calorically more productive lifestyle. It is capable of sustaining a larger population. So unsurprisingly, that's exactly what happened is that the earliest agricultural communities were an order of magnitude larger than hunter forager communities, which were essentially extended kinship groups. So, you know, a few dozen people at the, the advent of agricultural society, you were capable of supporting communities of many hundreds of people. Um, as things progress, eventually thousands. Um, and those sorts of societies are an order of magnitude more complex and capable of producing much more labor. And that's kind of the key to why agriculture was such an important development, is that the complexity of these societies and the productivity of these societies allowed them to be able to do stuff that these smaller hunter-forager communities never could. So everything that has happened subsequently, all of the great works of monumental architecture, the, the wonders of the ancient world, the tremendous empires that rose and fell, uh, only agricultural communities had sufficient labor force and complexity to do that. Uh, also to the diversity of these societies. In hunter-forager communities, everybody pretty much does the same thing. Everybody is involved in efforts to acquire food. Whereas, because individual labor hours are more productive in agricultural societies, this frees up at least a certain segment of the population to be involved in something other than food production. And that other uh, can be all sorts of stuff. Skilled artisanal labor, um, uh, positions of political or military leadership, uh, religion, uh, culture, the arts. Uh, certainly it's worth mentioning that uh, literacy is something that often follows along with agricultural societies. And so all of the things that follow from that, the accumulation of knowledge. I mean, ultimately why this is so important is that it is a, a pretty straight shot from the origins of agriculture to everything that we appreciate uh, about the modern world. So, you know, reading, watching movies, or, or TV shows, I mean, video games, the, the fact that we've been to the moon, which I mean, that, that's something to appreciate. You ever look up at the sky uh, at the moon on a clear night and go, holy crap, somebody walked on that. That's awesome. That doesn't happen without agriculture. Like obviously the effects aren't immediate, but they are significant. Okay, so that, that all sounds great, right? Like, wait, why would you even ask the question, is this BS? This brings us to some of the negative impacts that we might want to point out here. Now, we've already said that, okay, you know, agricultural labor is more productive, but do not take that to mean that somehow um, hunter-foragers worked harder than farmers. That's not at all the case. I mean, if you've ever known a farmer, they do nothing but work. Um, agriculture is in many ways, even though it's more productive, it's much more labor intensive. It requires a lot more consistent, hard, hard work. Take these two over to the garage, will you? I want them cleaned up for dinner. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. You can waste time with your friends when your chores are done. Now, come on, get to it. Um, and by comparison with, you know, the few 
hunter-gatherer, hunter-forager groups that have been around in the more modern era, it seems like they have way more leisure time than agricultural laborers. Four, five, six hours a day of, of labor tops is enough to produce enough food to sustain your hunter-gatherer band, whereas farmers have to work way more than that. Human beings evolved to subsist on that hunter-forager diet. You know, the diversity of naturally occurring you know, fruits, nuts, vegetables, uh, the lean proteins you can get from hunting, you know, that is what our biological machine runs on. Cereal grains do produce a lot calorically, but certainly you can make an argument that they are less nutritious than the sort of hunter-gatherer diet. It's one of the reasons why the quote-unquote paleo diet uh, was such a fad maybe like a decade ago. Uh, I don't endorse any diet plan by any stretch of the imagination, but I think there is an argument to be made that a hunter-forager diet is healthier. Um, and certainly the archaeological evidence would seem to indicate that early agriculturalists um, did not live as long as hunter-gatherers, uh, did not grow as large, that even though their work was more calorically productive, that in the long run there were fewer calories per member of these early agricultural societies. Also something to keep in mind, agricultural societies can often tend to be monocultures, to focus on one crop as the primary foodstuff. And if there is some sort of blight uh, that hits that crop or the harvest on that crop fails, you're pretty much screwed if your society is dependent on that. Like, everybody starves. That's not to say that hunter-gatherer bands are immune to famines, but they tend to be more mobile and more adaptable uh, with those sorts of challenges. Also, if you've got fixed settlements with lots of human waste being generated, human beings living in close quarters with their domesticated animals, that is a ripe environment for the spread of epidemic disease and the mutation of various viruses from animal species to, to hop over to human beings. I'm recording this video in 2020 during the whole COVID thing, so you know that kind of pandemic outbreak is only a problem in agricultural societies. It doesn't strike hunter-gatherer societies anywhere near as hard. And we already mentioned that agricultural society permits economic specialization, but with that invariably comes social inequality, that because not everybody does the same thing, it's not much of a leap to have that small group that says, well, we perform a special economic function in our society, to then make the argument, and therefore we are special. We deserve to be treated accordingly. We deserve access to more power, to more privilege, to more wealth than everybody else. Ah, now we see the violence inherent in the system. Shut up! Oh, come and see the violence inherent in the system! Help, help, I'm being repressed, bloody peasant! Oh, what a giveaway. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, eh? The scholar James Scott has also made what I think is a pretty compelling argument that agriculture seemed to have developed hand in hand with fairly oppressive early state systems. That agriculture was used as a tool by early tyrannical governments to control their labor force uh, and to extract wealth from them. Bonan, what is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of the women. Um, nomadic or pastoralist societies that move around a lot are very hard for those in authority to control or to tax, whereas agriculturalists, well, you know they're always in one place, they're by their fields. Um, their wealth in the form of crops and the stuff they raise is pretty bulky, it's hard to hide, and it's very seasonally regular. You know when the harvest is coming in, so if you're the tax man, you know exactly when to show up to get your cut. So maybe agriculture also lends itself pretty easily to the, the sort of level of oppressiveness you see in some of the earliest civilizations that you can make an argument that without agriculture, you don't get the moonshot, but also without agriculture, you don't get Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler or people like that. Recommended reading. Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, 
is an examination of why Western civilization often appeared to be so advantaged in comparison to other zones of humanity throughout history, uh, and does a good job, I think, of talking about the origins of agriculture and why we might have expected it to occur at places like the Western world that had more to work with. James Scott's Against the Grain, A Deep History of the Early Estates, discusses the close association between agriculture on the one hand, pretty heavy-handed governments on the other. Very interesting read, kind of provocative. And finally, Yuval Harari's Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind from 2014, is an overview of all of human history, kind of on a macro level, but does an excellent job, I think, of discussing the consequences of agriculture for human beings living in those societies. When it comes to our verdict, as compelling as some of these, these negative consequences are, I'm not going to say agriculture is BS. It was way too important. Uh, and personally, I like living in a society where you can have a cold beer, or read a good book, or watch a movie, or live indoors. But we, we shouldn't be so naive as to dismiss some of the profound disadvantages that come from living in agricultural communities, particularly in the earliest phase of the history of agriculture. So that's all for now. Remember, always check your evidence. Bye.